do you want to do a podcast? We make a darn good team. It always goes without a hitch. Let's head to Twitch and go start up the stream. Do you want to do a podcast? It's the Nerd Glasses Podcast. Let's start now. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Nerd Glasses Podcast. Come? All right, I'll do my, I'll do my own bit for myself. Oh! oh, wait, no silence. <laughs> We're doing it. Get off the road. Hey, Dave. Yes, Boater. A priest walks into a bar. Ouch. Thank you for enjoying this joke. If you enjoyed it, I encourage you to purchase the Minister DLC and to wishlist our Rabbi DLC coming out next month. <laughs> what about the very controversial uh, uh, other DLCs that were offered and then rescinded because people got very uncomfortable? I don't want you to uh, conflate official downloadable content with unofficial mods. We do not support mods to the bar joke. Um, you know, we're very happy with the creativity of our community, but. Uh, Telling such mods may uh, result in instability confused. in your joke, so we cannot condone uh, <laughs> using those. It may confuse the community. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Nerd Glasses Podcast. I'm Boater. I'm Dave Mann. I feel like that was one of our better joke intros. <laughs> that was some good riffing, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to another Tuesday edition. Uh, we've got... Some fun stuff. We're not going heavy like we did last week, so, you know, keep the light popcorn coming. Um, and actually, let me start off before I get to a Twitch ban. Uh, last week, we started off with the news that a streamer's daughter um, had gone missing. Uh, that was uh, Mikey Perk. His daughter has since been found on the... Second, she was safely returned home. So for those of you who are not following that story, she's back home. He said something to the effect of, you know, we're not going to go too in-depth into it right now, maybe later. And it's like, that's you and your family's business. Don't worry about it. We're happy that she's back safe. And we're glad that, you know, getting the word out on all the places available to you helped that happen. So, hey, from something wholesome, do you want to go to a Twitch ban, Dave? It's usually wholesome. People getting what they deserve. So I'm going to say the name, Indie Fox. So we know what we're in for. Um, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the whole ear lick ASMR meta that got both her and Amaranth banned. They got three-day bans. They came back. Amaranth kind of went, you know what? Just for a little bit, I'm going to scale back. I'm going to, you know, try to stay out of that spotlight. Indie Fox was like, nope, we're going for it. And was banned again on June 28th, which is just over a week ago. Um... However, in the intervening time, Twitter user Commander Root discovered via data mining that the account no longer has the partner flag on it. And in fact, this might be permanent. She no longer lists the uh, Twitch account on her Twitter profile. And that might just be like, hey, this isn't up right now, so I'm not going to send people there. Yeah. But it might also be like, finally, you found out. Good job. Um, Twitch and Indie Fox have not been more forthcoming on details. She you know, is either just patiently waiting for it to come back or she's waiting until her OnlyFans is ready to go. And Twitch, of course, never comments on on, on such things. Um, I saw something to the effect of that might get them in legal trouble. Like there was a precedent set in a different lawsuit that someone was unjustly banned. Um, I will try to look more into that, but I couldn't find enough concrete details where I want to like really go in depth. But hopefully Twitch will get more forthcoming and consistent with bans. But in the meantime, hopefully that's a final goodbye to Indie Fox. Mm -hmm. So that's the Twitch ban, everybody. What have we got coming out th uh, this week, Dave? Looking forward? There's, there's quite a bit going on, and... Uh... One sec. Uh, lost my train of thought. No and, problem. Um, While you bring that up, do you want me to uh, discuss something else? 
So, games that okay. are coming out in the next seven days. There was a little bit of a lull this weekend, uh, and it you know pairs with a lot of the different things going on. Um, but uh, one of the games that that flagged out to me was one that is technically getting re-released. So roll eyes, scowl about it, and it's not fifty nine ninety nine. So once again, roll eyes and scowl <laughs> about it. Um, but uh, Plague Tale Innocence is coming to the Nintendo Switch the PlayStation 5, and the Series X and S. Um, for those of you who didn't uh, play it or hear about it, it is an action-adventure survival horror stealth game okay. developed by Asobo Studio, one that Boder and I know intimately well, because what else did Asobo Studios produce, Boder? I don't know. Ah, but you do know, Boder. You know very well. You know very oh, wow. well they made in 2017. They were a part of in 2017. Zoo Tycoon? 2016. 2016. Oh, God, Recore! <laughs> ah! They were a part of the Windows port of it. You okay, know, okay. The one that kind of actually worked, uh, but not <laughs> really. Um, they are... Uh, it's a fun game. It's not necessarily everyone's cup of tea. It uh, takes place in uh, 1348, so you know. We're back to talking about Plague Tale. Awful, <laughs> uh, awful lot of uh, interesting things going on there with, with hover cars and all that. Um, <laughs> but I highly recommend it, and I look greatly forward to how these next-gen consoles presentations of it are able to take this story that was very cinematic uh, through the gameplay and everything and accent the gameplay, especially because there's a sequel coming. Um, and so I'm going to be getting into that sooner rather than later because it's free on PlayStation Plus uh, mm -hmm. and uh, will probably be on Game Pass sooner rather than later. I highly recommend checking it out. Um, but that's, of the next seven days, the game that stuck out to me the most. I'm also seeing a re-release of Layton's Mystery... Oh, sorry. Um, of Layton's Mystery Journey, Ketriel and the Millionaire's Conspiracy, uh, which was already out on Nintendo Switch, but I'm seeing DX Plus at the end of this. I'm not sure. I can I can look up what's new for that. Unfortunately, Wikipedia was not more forthcoming about what uh, DX Plus is. Um, but uh, hopefully, like I really enjoyed playing Layton's Mystery Journal. Um, it was a lot of fun and. It is apparently being re-released with a new voice cast in Je voice cast in Japanese, um, so that might be released exclusively in Japan. Okay, so my guess is then looking at this that it was released for the Switch in the U.S. last year, I think, and it's getting its Japanese release now. Um, prior to that, it had only been out on DS. But yay, more consoles, more regions, always a good thing. How's it going, Vladdy? So that's what came. What's coming out in the next seven days? Um, again, yeah, we are in that like midsummer lull. This this isn't really a release window for a lot of stuff, and a lot of what we were seeing in the earlier release window, like earlier this year, was a lot of re-releases. I'm thinking slash hoping that this holiday season is when we're going to start seeing um, a lot of big new games coming out not re-releases not going up to the next console but straight up new games and that's going to be a factor of the consoles have been out long enough that uh, people more people are developing for them and that stuff that's in development has come to fruition mm -hmm. and also because of the pandemic last year a lot of stuff was delayed that i think is getting pushed back to holiday this upcoming year so probably september maybe we'll start seeing some of these big things coming out though it'll be not that we haven't had some big happy releases in the meantime, but I think we'll start seeing more of them now. Also off the tail end of E3, where a lot of it's talking about futures as opposed to immediacy. Yes, exactly. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm going to drop something that isn't quite video games, but is still up our bespectacled alley. Mm -hmm. um, and that is Star Wars Visions. Uh, this was announced at Anime Expo Light this past weekend, uh, and similar to, oh my gosh, I can't think of them. I think Halo Legends was an anime anthology, um, 
Matrix. Oh my gosh, what was the Matrix one? That was one that like kicked off doing anime anthologies for Western franchises. Matrix Reloaded? No. Um, yeah, an- was- Animatrix. Yes, Animatrix. Um, so similar to those, it's going to be at least seven short films. I say at least seven. They say that they've got seven studios. Um, I've seen other numbers, like it might be ten films, it might be nine films, I'm not sure. But just a whole bunch of anime films set in the Star Wars universe. That's going to be really cool, because Star Wars, at its root, has always pulled a lot from Japanese cinematography. And some of these look like they are straight, like, going back to being very, say, Miyazaki-focused, like very classic uh, Japanese cinema. Others are looking a little more modern. Uh, there's one that looks like very Astro Boy to go back to like some roots of anime. Uh, there's it looks like there's a lot of cool stuff. People that are excited to to get to it. Um, I can't wait to see it, and I won't have to wait long because Star Wars Vision come Star Wars Visions comes out September 22nd. So. I'm excited for that. I've just got so much Star Wars going on right now. <laughs> uh, I assume that that's going to be on Disney+. Plus. I actually don't know if I read it, but it makes sense because that's where everything Star Wars is coming out right now. Bad Batch has been really good if you haven't been watching. <laughs> Quick aside. So is, so is Loki. Uh, there's a bunch of good stuff coming out right now, folks. Your subscription services have paid off never more than now these days. Yeah, it's it's interesting that like everything kind of has its own subscription service. Um, Disney is the first one that I was really tempted to get outside of the Netflix, Hulu, you know, mainstays that went into streaming. Um, but I am very happy with what I pay for for Disney Plus. Um, as opposed to, like, I saw one thing that was like, that might be sort of... In- oh, it's on Peacock. I don't care. <laughs> Speaking of Star Wars on Disney+. Plus, um, Sure. Uh, if you watch Star Wars on... Di- hmm. <clears throat> If you watch Star Wars on Disney Plus, you'll remember the show. You know, it's very little, well, very, very lowly. Doesn't really get a lot of attention. Uh, isn't really garnering a lot of headlines and things like that. But The Mandalorian, um, and some of you out there may remember the uh, famous moment where uh, Baby Yoda, as as many a folk out there know, uh, was. Uh, spoiler alert for for plot points ahead from season was one separated from um, the Mandalorian and in the clutches of a scout trooper and a uh, little, little guy was in a bag and he was rustling around and a famous moment where a stormtrooper just flat hand just punched him right on top of the head uh, they're making a scale a Sixth scale figure set, wow. not of Grogu getting punched, <laughs> but of the moments that surrounded that. It is a scout trooper on a bike uh, in sixth scale, uh, which means it comes with a a very excited and happy looking Grogu. Oh my um, god! Yeah, he's in the bag and just like ah. But you can recreate that moment with the hands on the figure. Um, yeah, so actually, fully in the ads, do they show that moment? Yeah, <laughs> they show damn near close to it with him opening the bag and uh, looking at it, which was hysterical to watch that moment in the series. Yeah, what is it? Quit looking at it. No, what is it? Like it was great. It was just like the first three minutes of the final episode of the season, and it's just these two scout troopers who are absolutely bored with their job, holding on to some little thing that they don't know what it is. Uh, so if you are a fan of the collectibles end of things like this, um. You can pre-order it now from Hot Toys or SideshowToys.com uh, for four hundred and fifty-five dollars. But don't worry, you can get a layaway flex for one hundred and thirty-six dollars and fifty cents a month. 
You're pre-approved. I mean, one six scale. That's basically trooper stands almost a foot tall. You know, taller than this. That's good size. It'll be interesting. Uh, uh, historically speaking, uh, did a quick little look through and chatted with some of my friends. The Star Wars toys akin to this hang on to their value mm-hmm. on the collectors and the trade, uh, even if removed from the box. But the box is required um, afterwards. Um, the speeder bike is enormous. Oh my god! Yeah, uh, it's it's longer shown, than my f- sorry sorry dude longer than scale. my forearm definitely. And it comes with many different customizable points and moments and lots of different details. Side a lot of collectibles fun. does a really good job with their stuff. It's a good size scale. It's gonna be great for either setting up like a diorama or just being able to move it into different scenes. That's that's that's. Uh, a figure that I wouldn't have expected to be made out of everything that I've seen, but as soon as I saw like that picture of the scale scout trooper with Grogu happily peeking out of the bag, I'm like, oh, that's a natural. So quit buying Bitcoin and buy yourself a, a, a scout trooper. Hey, speaking of quit buying cryptocurrency, mm-hmm. Um, FaZe Clan, which I'm not sure if we've mentioned too much before, but they do... Yes, we talked about the beginning of this story last week. Okay, yeah. Um, they ended up firing K, as well as suspending three others of the group, Jarvis, Nikan, and Tico, over a cryptocurrency scam. Um, basically, what they were doing, they have, uh, well, K especially has a history of talking up new crypto coins and being like, it's the next big thing. It's going to be an investment. It's going to do really well. Um, and then as soon as it starts going up, he sells all of his and the market inevitably crashes again because altcoins are a dime a dozen. Uh, actually, the conversion rate is much worse than a dime a dozen. Um <laughs> currency jokes the latest coin was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back um it was called save the kids and it was being billed as something where proceeds would go to charity now i'm not sure exactly where the proceeds would go since when you buy a crypto coin your money should go one to one into that uh but nonetheless it of course tanked people lost a ton of money nothing went to charity K said after the fact, I want you all to know that I had no ill intent promoting any crypto altcoins. I honestly and naively thought we all had a chance to win, which just isn't the case. I didn't vet any of this with my team at FaZe, and now I know and I now know I should have. Which rings as a very hollow uh statement considering he's done this a bunch before. Mm. Um FaZe themselves said, We have made the decision to remove K from FaZe Clan and have suspended Jarvis, Nikon, and Tico until further notice. FaZe Clan has absolutely no involvement with our members' activity in the cryptocurrency space, and we strongly condemn their recent behavior. The trust and respect of our fans has been and will always be our number one priority. So, um... Crypto's a scam? <laughs> uh, I mean, that's that's a wide brush to paint, and they're certainly... Um, uh, exceptions to that, but like if someone's like, "Hey, here's this new coin that we're gonna talk up," chances are you're gonna lose money on it. Um, the people that breathe this stuff day in and day out, they will make money, and it will be at your expense. So, don't do it. And I'm glad that uh, for the second time on our program, we're looking at someone who has faced repercussions for scummy actions. Speaking of scum, when you live for our do something illegal and then you are punished by it, even if it's just simple, of the law, uh-huh. you are thereby declared that you are to pay recompenses in the form of labor, imprisonment, financial gains and otherwise, and our poor Poor, impoverished friends at Nintendo were such, were so, so dis- despicably put out by a, a heathen that dared put ROMs online. Now, we talked about this a year ago. Yeah, we talked about it a couple weeks ago. <laughs> one, of those, one of those folks were brought to justice over it, and they were to be sued in court and then they decided to represent themselves in court, as we discussed about this at the time on the Nerd Glasses, and they lost. Well, Terribly. 
this scallywag's main course of income was uh, actually this illegal website uh, called Rom Universe. And so, there it has been since decreed there is to be $35,000 for each of the 49 game, Nintendo games found on the site, plus $400,000 in trademark damages mm-hmm. to be paid in monthly installments of $50. Because that's all Matthew Storman could afford. That's all he said he could afford, which would not add up to that within any reasonable human lifetime. But sure, it's a start. How did it go? I, I mean, it's now $50 a month, so <laughs> we shall see uh, how that goes and uh, what the totals will be. Um, but just know that there's punishments, and then there's kind of getting away with it, to be totally honest. But I, I think last I heard was that he couldn't even make his first $50 payment, or he didn't make it. So Nintendo's like, listen, dude, I, we asked for... Like, pennies on the dollar, and you're still not paying it. Uh, so that's going to stay tied up in the legal system for a while. Especially as he, like, appeals and so forth. So, interesting to follow. It's Normally, I don't like to root for the big guy against the little guy. But Stormin was just so blatant with it. It's like, okay, Nintendo, let's keep it up. You're doing good. It- Play stupid games, win stupid stupid prizes. prizes. We say it every week here on the program, and it gets truer every week. Um, Man, what a fortunate person that he represented himself in court and wasn't held to some other stricter punishments or things. Right. Um, It's almost like they took pity on him and said, wow, you were so bad at this. Here's a slap on the wrist payment. Ugh. Um, one more follow-up that I've got, and that is with Humble Bundle. We talked about them back in May, I want to say, um, when they introduced a change where they were going to get rid of, um, where their sliders, which would go to charity, Humble Bundle itself, or to the developers, which up to now you could move to any amount, including putting 100% to charity or 100% to the devs or whatever, um, they were going to cap the charity donation at 15%, the, with the rest to be split between Humble Bundle and the developers or something like that. Um, that went over about as well as a flying brick, um, which is to say it didn't. Uh, and they quickly were like, oops, JK, let's go back to the drawing board. And now from the drawing board, they have come with the next revision, which is that, yes, we'll keep the sliders. Um, however, there is going to be a minimum amount that needs to go to Humble Bundle between 15 and 30%, depending on the bundle. So you may go in and it's like, all right, Humble Bundle needs at least 20% of this. The remaining 80, you can distribute however you like. Which is a lot better. Um, you know, not quite as good as before, but it is one of those things where, okay, I understand that it does need money to operate. I feel like it's getting bigger than it needed to, and it's still trying to expand, and the awful, icky American capitalist need for growth rather than just being happy with what you're doing. But that is much better than capping the charity donation at 15%. Because otherwise what would have happened was that, all right, cool, we do that, and then 85 goes to the developers. Screw you, Humble Bundle, for doing that. Put in a note. Devs, can you please donate more of this? (laughs) (sighs) Um, So that's better and now there are a lot of people with a close eye on humble to make sure that they stay humble um and don't keep overreaching so that's a a follow-up that is better than it could have been and we'll we'll see how that continues to plan to to pan out Don't you hate it on social media when you're doing things and you get messages from, like, the bots that are just basically trying to leave you for information? Yeah. I've gotten really bored of that. Okay. So instead of just blocking them, I've decided I'm going to start messaging them things. Why not get them to try to join the St. Jude's team for next year? 
Uh, is I'll, that... I'll do this as a as a weekly segment, but uh, I have one. So I'm not. I I wanted to show some visuals, but I decided not to because I don't know where the person's pictures came from or where their name came from. Okay, fair. Um, but just know this person uh, has 39 followers and three posts. And they messaged me on Sunday, randomly, hello, with a wavy hand. And I said, howdy. Interested in joining the team to help fight against childhood cancer? They responded uh, 30 minutes later, what's the name of your team? I said, it's Damn Bugs, a collaboration of a few different streamers during the Play Live season. They responded, with uh, at uh, uh, two minutes later, with okay, cool. Your name, please. Okay. So I responded with uh, baseball star Zach Granke is my name, and they said it's my pleasure to meet you, Zach. Contacting me on my Instagram, which has my name on it, yep, and my face, yep, and things like that. It's, it's not um, even like some of yours, which are DAM. Your Instagram is straight up your name. Um. Another one uh, from Saturday, which is, hey, looking for coffee lovers for our recycled cup brand. Please, you'd make the perfect fit. Please message on our main account. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. So I sent, perfect. While I'm doing that, any interest in teaming up to help fight childhood cancer? Well, they looked at it, and so I spammed them with the Homer Simpson, join <laughs> us. Pa- couch pat. Um, and uh, I'm going to keep doing this. Because it's hilarious. Oh, yeah. And it's fun for me. And uh, so we'll see if we can't get more people to join the team for St. Jude's. Especially because they're so uppingly mobile on social media. Oh, yeah. We could use the help. Oh, yeah. Um, And when they inevitably ignore, you just get that extra, oh, not only were you trying to trick me, you also don't care about the kids. It's for the kids. Uh, Let's see here. Um, let's go with Magic Legends. Did we talk about that when it was announced and when it first went in its public beta? I believe so. Uh, although I do not think so because I remember, uh, Geek for All did a, uh, uh, there's my, there's my one a week plug for somebody else yep. other yep. than Insane yep. Games TV. Hit the follow button. Don't get jelly. Make sure you hit the follow button and ring the bell. Um, but uh, I know they got an invite to play it early. Uh-huh. But uh, after that, they weren't playing it, and it and and seeing it didn't necessarily spark my fandom. Um, yeah, it got kind of a mixed results as it first came out. It's basically it took some of the mechanics of Magic: The Gathering, the as well as the idea of doing like a deck building kind of thing, while mixing it with a Diablo style action RPG. Mm-hmm. Had a really rough start. They've been working on it. It's in beta, but they announced that they will not be advancing with the game out of beta. Now, I'm surprised. They are actually going to keep the beta going until October 31st. That is still... You've still got four months to play the game. um, And it's only been going for like three months for now. So it's Hmm. interesting that they're keeping it live for as long as they are. I wonder if they've got more planned for it or something else. They've said when it's done, it's done. We're not going to do anything else with Magic Legends. But for for four months to go either they do have more up their sleeve for magic legends or they are going to be testing some features in that game that they are actually planning on using in the next game and they want to see how it's received here which if you know hey cool this is something that has no expectations people know it's going to go away i can test whatever i want in here test some mechanics test some stuff out and maybe it'll go in your next project Mm mm-hmm um, Never ever... a bad thing when you have uh, basically a Gary's Mod room full of people that are invested in one facet or another to then feed back at you about it. Yeah. Have you ever have you ever played a game that you really enjoyed but just didn't get out of beta? Like, have you, have you ever been in, like, a, a public beta or a closed beta and it just, it didn't end up getting released? Not a closed beta, but I've been, invo- I've been involved with a couple games that I liked but just never made it over the hump for, like... Uh, live online. Have you played any? Yeah, there was Star Wars Attack Squadrons. I think it was called Attack Squadrons. 
Um, it's before Star Wars Squadrons. It was like a much more arcadey third person dogfighting, X Wings and Tie Fighters and stuff hmm. like that. Um, and I remember it had a lot of like really cool skins for the X Wings. Um, I enjoyed the gameplay. I was pretty good at it, but it was like mouse and keyboard kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it didn't end up uh, getting out of its. I think I was in an open beta, but I might have been in a closed beta as well. I'm not sure. Um, it didn't end up getting out of beta, unfortunately, uh, which is a shame because a lot of the skins and stuff had cool references to Star Wars Expanded Universe. This was before the Disney buyout, I want to say. But maybe it's even because of the Disney buyout it didn't get completed. Either way, yeah, that's my main... I've had a couple of beta experiences. My other was um, Kingdom for Keflings coming to PC, and that did end up getting released on PC. But um, yeah, it's it's interesting. And yeah, like just because something is in beta and you're trying it out there is no guarantee that it's going to get released. Oh, also, I played Minecraft while it was in beta, but who the hell didn't? <laughs> okay, fair. Console for life. Um, Sucks to be you. So, that's an interesting move, though, to still, I guess, to say, yeah, it's dead, but it's still going to be up. Yeah, until October 31st. Like, that is so weird. It, I'm guess. You know, uh, I'm a shithead and don't know fuck, but uh, I think it's uh, that it could be um, contracts already paid, uh, studios already open, things like that. Could be. And, you know, it'll be cheaper for us to keep it open till the end of blank and then roll yeah. it over. I mean, like, I could see them, you know, if they have um, creators who are under contract... I would have a hard time believing that they couldn't reallocate them to something else. But if they don't have another project ready to go, if they're still in planning phases for something else, yeah, maybe, all right, we'll keep them under contract until the end of that, the the beta period. And like I said, they may very well use it to test some stuff for their next game. Who knows? Um, let's see here. Oh, boy. You mentioned trolling on social media. Mm-hmm. Um, a new social network went up in the past week um, created by um, Trump's team called Gitter. G-E-T-T-R. Oh. Yeah. Um, uh, th- that's just such a great name that I kind of don't feel like unpacking right now. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all right, cool. Uh, our former president made this thing. Time to go be patriotic. And by patriotic, I mean a whole bunch of people going to the site and flooding it with Sonic the Hedgehog smut. Because if you have a bunch of shitheads together, best make it difficult for them to exist there. Um, it's fabulous what I've seen. All or I can give say... attention to something and put a follower base on something that can now use the user base numbers as advertising revenue, things like that, instead of just letting it fester and die over there as it would have. I can see that. I can um, see that. Startups on the internet, as we were just talking about with betas, things like that die all the time on their own. Yeah. But if we pay attention to them, it gets big, like Dogecoin or yeah. jokes like that. Um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see if it's something where, like, if enough um, trolls get on it and just kind of force the quote unquote legitimate users off the site because m- making it entirely unusable. Like, just imagine Sonic presenting himself with hashtag back the blue. I like the imagery. Mm. In the abstract kind of way, not the specific. Anyway, that's that. Cross that off 15 times. While we're on the subject of things that are dead and should never come back, uh, do you own a Nintendo console? Do you have a subscription to Netflix? I do. Nary shall the two of them meet after the last couple of updates. The Wii U is officially uh, not going to be able to run uh, larger streaming digital platforms like Netflix and Disney Plus um, and things like that. Uh, So as of uh, six days ago, uh, your Nintendo consoles won't participate in such things. Uh, Nintendo has attempted to move away from hosting streaming things on their uh, devices since the Wii U. Mm-hmm. They didn't uh, put the uh, services for it on the Switch yet um, and hadn't yet announced anything, but your Wii U, after the recent updates and things for, for uh, Netflix, will no longer be able to run it. Um, stop on by and get an Xbox 360 
and a PS3. They'll still run it there. Huh? Yeah. Uh, PS3 mm. won't run Disney Plus, but does still run Netflix. Um, and it's interesting because, like, the Wii U was made as one of those, like, this is going to be a home entertainment center. So, yes, we wanted to have all that stuff. The Switch isn't marketed like that. The Switch can dock into a TV, but um, as we'll we'll see as we talk about something else later in the program, a lot of what they do with Switch is marketing towards the handheld kind of thing. Um, and while it would somewhat behoove them to have maybe Netflix on something handheld, everyone has something else handheld that also has Netflix and Disney Plus and such on it. It's right here. They carry them with it everywhere they go, so it doesn't need to be on the Switch. It's not something that they need to support. Um, you know, these things never made it to the Switch in the first place. So I don't see them doing so at this point going forward. Um, kind of stinks that the Wii U won't support it anymore, but they can only, you know, support so much with protocols on an older system that isn't getting support anymore. So, um, but yeah, uh, a new announcement today um that there is going to be a not a new generation of Nintendo Switch coming but a a refresh of sorts um and this is the Nintendo Switch open parenthesis OLED version close parenthesis sorry OLED model um it's not a Switch 2 it's not a Switch 1.5 it is Switch OLED model um PS3 also can't stream Twitch. True. So probably Nintendo also not being able to do stuff like that. So, um, yeah. So I like some of the improvements being made to the Switch. Um, Dave, do you want to go through what we've got with some of the improvements in the OLED model? Yeah, sure. I'll uh, I'll drop the Nintendo so that you guys can look along with us and peruse as you will. Uh, but we have a 7-inch OLED screen. I think that's up from 6.2. Yes. So it's not going to be much bigger, but it will be bigger. Yeah. Um, OLED actually, even though it's going to be the same resolution, it's still 1080p, it's going to look a little crisper. Even though it's a lower pixel density, OLED generally looks a bit crisper than the uh, LCD did before. They are adjusting one of the things that that did baffle with the switch, which is that the stand in some cases, if you had joy cons on it and the switch had a case on it, just couldn't hold up its own weight. Um, and would, would fall. They are adjusting it so that the entire bottom half of the back flips out so that it can a frame and, uh, hold up while you're gaming. Um, apparently it's also adjustable, which will be incredible. Nice. Um, yeah, I've, I've never been able to like set the switch down with that little kickstand fully deployed and say, yes, this is the perfect angle at which to play the switch. I'm looking forward to it, especially as a, as a tool. Um, if I'm on the train or something like that, where I put, or on a plane where I put the tray down and then being able to adjust it, depending on where the light source is so that it doesn't catch the reflections with that, a minor feature for people that are going to be running out and grabbing it. Um, one that will be interesting, uh, gamers or things like that, is it's going to have a built-in wired LAN port uh, to be able to uh, uh, attach it to the dock so it will be able to be wired instead of just on the Wi-Fi. I think that there was an official dongle to go from USB yes. to Ethernet, but that was probably like 60 bucks or something. So it's nice that it's going to be built in. And the biggest catch for it all, it's not a great amount, but it will be substantial considering uh, the Switch's lifestyle and games. Uh, there will be 64 gigabytes of internal storage. Rather than the 32 that came before. I think we have an SD card in ours anyway because it's expandable, but it's nice that it'll be built in. Um, I saw some complaints that, oh, it's not 4K, oh, it's not more powerful because Breath of the Wild sometimes chugs and has a hard time reaching 30 frames a second. Um, I don't like when a console does a mid-cycle refresh that makes it more powerful. Hmm. Because um, I'm going to use Control as an example on the Xbox One. On the Xbox One X, it plays more smoothly, it has much better loading times, um, 
and you can tell that it was developed for that, but it is an Xbox One game, and I played it on my Xbox One, and it has a hard time chugging through frames in some of the bigger areas, and loading times reach almost a minute. Um, like, you can tell with games that are later in a cycle, after there's been kind of this mid-cycle refresh, uh, same with, like, the PS4 Pro, that something is developed for that. Um, like, uh, Cyberpunk 2077 shouldn't be played on a regular Xbox One or a PS4, but is okay on an Xbox One X or a PS4 Pro. How is your random consumer supposed to know that as far as they're concerned? This box says Xbox One, so I can play it on my Xbox One. Um, so I'm glad that while there are some upgrades to what the Switch is doing, the screen looks a little better, um, the kickstand is really cool, um, I'm glad that they're not actually doing a lot more with the, that, that they're not upgrading the internals and making a split like that in the development of software for the Switch. Interesting enough that they waited... They had a booth at E3, they had a booth, they had a time slot, and they decided not to announce this. Um, and I was chatting with some folks, and it basically came down to, had they have announced this during E3, it would have been widely panned by an already underwhelmed internet audience hmm. uh, with the events of E3, considering the wild rumors that were rampant about the next switch it being 4k it yeah. having this and that and the other and it was going to pop the popcorn and you know make the beds and burp the babies like yeah um yeah. so it'll uh i'm i'm excited for it it'll msrp for 50 dollars higher than your standard uh nintendo switch uh so that'll be 349.99 as opposed to 299 um and so they are going to sell the OLED models. They're going to push the old Switch models off, but they are going to continue making and, and distributing the Switch Lite models as well. Okay. Um, it's interesting. I'm excited for it. I'm probably not going to win the lottery recently to be able to buy one in October yeah. when it comes out, but uh, it could happen. Our our switch is almost always docked to the TV, and there's not a lot of improvements for that. The only one is that uh, Ethernet cable, uh, which would, we would have a hard time running Ethernet cable up there anyway. Mm. If we were going to, we would have already had one going to the PS4. Um, not the case for everybody, I'll admit. Um, so for people that keep their switch docked to their TV, there is very little here that is for you. Um, and that's fine, too. So... It will, however, be released around and and with the new Metroid game, Dread, um, which yep. is partially why the OLED models are being displayed with the white Joy-Cons as a way of connecting the two properties. Okay. Um, but you can still purchase the Nintendo Switch uh, OLED model with the red and blue Joy-Cons. Okay. All the same Joy-Cons are going to be compatible with the new yes. model? Yes. Oh, yeah. Cool. The Joy-Cons are exactly the same across. I will say, Boda, right up front, that I'm willing to bet Nintendo will have fixed the Joy-Con drift issue. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I haven't had issues with ours too much um, recently. I think they've been incrementally getting it better. I think by now it's been dialed in. And so they're like, all right, cool, we got that fixed. Now we can work on a hardware revision, and we'll see how that kind of... We'll see. But what if it isn't? How funny would that be for the people <laughs> that were unable somehow, well, through through shopping and the pandemic and everything else, to just not get their hands on a Switch, and then they get the OLED Switch, and they're like, my Joy-Cons don't work! And everyone's like, welcome to the club, pal! <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Let's, let's stay on this for a moment. We're talking about the Nintendo with the Switch. Something Nintendo does very well is working with indie developers. Mm. Um, there are a lot of places on the Nintendo shop to feature up-and-coming games. Um, and Nintendo is pretty easy to work with when it comes to uh, setting prices, setting discounts, stuff like that. Um, it's not as easy as, say, Steam, where you just go in a uh, 30% discount because I feel like it. Because it's Tuesday. Whatever. Um, but Nintendo makes it pretty easy. Microsoft makes it pretty easy. Who doesn't make it easy is PlayStation. Um, 
and some developers kind of uh, had a collective let's complain about PlayStation. I can't think of something more creative than that on Twitter um, where they compared how their games perform on uh, the platform. They were talking about how like, you know, there's no there's no discovery on the mm-hmm. PlayStation Store. In order to get a game, you need to know what it's called. If it is not the latest AAA that PlayStation themselves are releasing, there's no discovery. Um, mm-hmm. You can buy ad placement for $25,000, um, which is outside the budget of an entire game for some of these indies. Um, I saw something that said, yeah, Sony doesn't consider you an indie unless your budget is like three hundred grand." <laughs> Uh, um, it's like, oh yeah, that's that's indie. So it's it's not super friendly with that. Um, some numbers. Matthew Wright of Whitethorn Games said that the Nintendo Switch makes sixty percent of their sales. Uh, Xbox thirty percent. Steam makes seven percent, and PlayStation is three percent. Um, Christian Botea of Those Awesome Games uh, mostly sells on PC with Steam at ninety one point five percent. Switch makes up most of the rest at 7.6%, and then Xbox at 06 and PlayStation at 03 More than just the games themselves, getting your Rabbi DLC out there to uh, to be visible. Um, a dev who remained anonymous, this was reporting done by Kotaku, so some of these people were, were talking with uh, the writer at Kotaku. A dev who wanted to remain anonymous said that a game sold 20,000 copies on the Xbox and 7,000 on the PlayStation. So that's more on Xbox, but not a huge disparity. The DLC for the game sold 2,000 on Xbox and 7... 7... Not 7,000, not 700, 7 on PlayStation. So, um... Sony admits that they have a problem with um, getting indie games out there. But they haven't actually done anything about it. And they've known for years. And their solution is, I don't know, give us money. We can give you, we can sell you some ad space. Um, and that, as much as I like to be like, yay Xbox, blue, blue, boo PlayStation, um, this is unfortunate because the more platforms that are out there for people to get their stuff out, um, the better it is for all indie developers. Like if someone says, hey, I want to do a 15% discount on the game this day and match what we're doing on the rest of our platforms, Mm -hmm. they can't. They have to wait for an invitation to a promotion and are saddled with a 50% discount during that promotion. Um, So uh, it's not exactly a news item. It's not something new, but it is something that a lot of developers were kind of speaking up about and kind of collectively airing their grievance over um, on Twitter. So, Yeah. Um, Looking forward to seeing what the PlayStation 5 um, targets with some of this. Just uh, right now, the the interface for the store itself is, to me, odd. Um, It's drop down, it's, it's scroll down menus, and then just infinitely scrolling down on on lists and this and that and the other so finding things in particular if i'm not looking for anything in particular is is uh not user friendly um or even when i do go into like the summer sales or things like that it's it's a it's a lot like trying to pick out one piece of confetti in a in a rain of it like yeah. you know, oh, that's a dollar. Well, it's a dollar. Like I'm more looking at what the base, what the base cost of it is, at any point than rather than what the content is. Um, I've enjoyed the games that I've purchased for like a buck. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Sony's Sony's uh, uh, UI just just leaves a lot to be desired. Um, yeah, it's it sacrifices a lot of usability in the interest of being clean. Uh, as compared to you go to the Xbox dashboard even before you get to the store. Ugh. And it is very cluttered. But some of these developers are saying, yeah, I heard, you know, I'm seeing on Twitter that someone's just like, oh, I discovered this game because it was right there on the dashboard and it looked cool. Um, 
Do, so do you these want, are opposite sides of what you can do. do. Do you want Quiet Town with one singular Seven Eleven and one employee, or do you want the Market Bazaar from uh, from Aladdin? Those are the two <laughs> different things you can have. Nary shall the, either of them be. Uh, I, I feel and, like Steam and Nintendo do a better job of like let's show you stuff without going full chaos. I would say Nintendo goes full chaos just because their shop is not all that functional for me either. Okay. Um, but I've, used, I've used it very little, to be The fair. other half is that Nintendo's shop doesn't have much, so it's very good to do this up front so that you don't realize that there's not a depth to dive into. Okay. Okay. Um, they do a very good job of... What will happen on the Nintendo shop, and if anyone hasn't realized it yet, is three different tabs on the menu are games that don't exist yet. <laughs> It's good, because I find myself going over there and going like, wow, I can't wait to play that. And then I'm like, can't wait to play that, but I have nothing to do now. Like, yep, I'm going to go back to playing Shin Sakai. That's it. Like, um, it's done. Really, Nintendo has done very well to guide me back to the games I already own because <laughs> of that. Um, but that's also been, you know, the story of the Wii U, where I was like, wow, I can't wait to have another game. Can't wait for Breath of the Wild to come out. And then at that point, I was just like, am I playing Breath of the Wild? No, my Switch isn't on, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting. You mentioned that. Oh, yeah, going back to the games I've already played. How much do you do that when you go into like a video game store or like a bookstore? Like half the time I go into a bookstore, the only titles that pop out at me are titles I already own and have read. I'm like, no, stop looking at this. You already own two copies. Look for something else. <laughs> Books for me, not so much. I'm always looking at what I haven't seen yet and, uh. and trying to find those books that connect pieces that I remember or things okay. like that. Um, but with video games, with Nintendo, I revisit games a lot. Um, with Sony, it's a cycle. Um, so, like, right now, uh, it's it's um, MLB The Show 21, uh, Madden 19. Get on it, Madden. You suck. Um, uh, Overwatch, and it will always be Overwatch. And then um, what will be uh, at one point or another, some of the Battle Royale games, be it Warzone or other ones, uh, just playing with folks. Yeah. Uh, but then those ones slowly do cycle out, and a new one comes in. Yeah, um, I gotcha. But with Nintendo... Constantly replaying the games I've already played. Uh, I have burnt Doom 64 on that console to the ground. Um, <laughs> I'm just replaying it and enjoying the hell out of it. Um, so yeah, how about you? Um, I mean, I, like I said, like when I when I go in here and I uh, when I look at like the Xbox One games, half the time the stuff that pops out to me is stuff I've already played. You know, like oh hey, that's uh, it's cool. Yeah, of course it's cool. I played that five times already. Oh, that's Boater. That's Recore. Put it down. Uh, <laughs> Stuff like that. Or like, oh, hey, this game looks cool. Oh, no, I looked up the reviews on this one, and it's a bad game. That's why I haven't bought it yet. Stop catching my eye, same game. Or like, I go into any bookstore, and I'm like, oh, hey, that book I've read. Oh, hey, that other book I've read. And it's just really hard for me when faced with like, <laughs> a thousand different spines to notice new stuff. Uh, especially to the same extent that I did when I actually worked at a bookstore and saw them coming in every week. You know, when a dozen new books come in, I get the chance to look at each of the dozen before putting them on the shelf. When I go to a bookstore once every two months now, it's just like, ah! <laughs> Choices! <sighs> Bookstores lately, I don't know about you, but they've been doing a very good job of... Um... What's the terminology called for this practice where you go in for one thing and because they've laid everything out in such a good way that you wind up with like merchandising. Yeah. Uh, you wind up with like 800 things anyway. Um, mm -hmm. I went in to get a student activity book. I left with a student activity book, a crayon kit, a science kit. Uh, and an adult activity book, uh, just because th like everything was in such a way where while I'm hunting, it was just like, oh yeah, this will work, and that, oh, I'm gonna get that, like yeah, um, yeah, definitely, like especially so again, a lot of my experience at Northshire, a lot of it is 
people who care and people constantly keeping the end caps updated so that a lot of stuff is going to draw your eye. People that know the the stuff with activity books and make sure that the best ones are face out so that people would be, oh, cool. Yeah, that one looks great. Yeah. You know. It's just been interesting to see because over the years, you know, there was that long term discussion of, well, will bookstores survive the Nook and and Amazon and, and Kindle and and all these things and it seems like, uh, I'm not going to lie, Pandemic seems to have, I'll, I'll look some stats up for this, but seems to have kind of helped brick and mortar stores because then when everybody couldn't, then when they could, everybody wanted to. Yeah. Where they didn't and that or just don't, and now they do. I would definitely be interested in seeing some numbers on that. Unfortunately, I can't give firsthand experience on that anymore because I don't work in book selling. Uh, like I used to. And if I did, I wouldn't actually share numbers like that. Uh, the good news is them. Fortune 500 companies, uh, all of their records are public. And so we'll have a look at those. So, yeah, we can see how, for instance, Barnes & Noble is doing uh, in the economic recovery. Barnes & Noble, BAM, um, GameStop, um, Clever Bastards flipping that cryptocurrency before it became worthless. Um <laughs> How come they're not getting in trouble with everybody? Uh, it wasn't crypto. It was their stock. <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> it's play money for rich people. It's the same thing. <laughs> oh, boy. we're gonna. I'm going to have economists trying to kill me. Jump in line. Uh, any other big ones you want to hit? I've got a couple small topics. Um, this Friday... Uh, very excited to uh, uh, pitch this. My wife will be hosting an event here in the Wilton Mall Ooh. for Hope, um, which the analogy now I, of course, wrote everything down but that, and I want to make sure to represent them properly. Uh, homes for Open Pets exist. They are here inside the Wilton Mall. They opened up uh, around the corner. You'll see them on weekends transporting adorable fluffy friends uh, for people to adopt. Uh, this Friday, they are running an event called Paint and Pet. Uh, July 9th at 7 p.m. It is a $25 donation at the door. Um, and Claire will be teaching uh, or running a little you know, a paint and sip model where everyone gets a canvas and some brushes and some paint and she'll be running a paint lesson and there's going to be cats and small furry animals for everyone to pet and maybe take home. Mm, you could be. Um, that'll be out of town Friday night. But Steph, don't come back home with another dog, please. That'll be this Friday. Uh, I'm excited. I'm definitely going to be there. Uh, and some of the members of the Weekend Wednesday community are are coming around. Um, and so I hope to see you there. And not just because I will definitely be running around with like tw like a, an armful <laughs> of cats just going like, like, oh, yeah, there's painting. Mm. <laughs> um, but Hope for Animal, uh, Homes for Animals... Uh, uh, for Orphan Pets Exist yes. this Friday. Uh, look them up, Hope, on Facebook. Uh, and make sure to come by the Wilton Mall. While you're here, stop into Insane Games. Say hey to the crew here on Friday. Tune in to Brothers in Arms as Lucas and Cody will be here uh, crushing it in Call of Duty. Um, and I'm very excited uh, uh, to be doing so. Uh I, I do have one more, st another story, but I'm going to save it for next week because I okay. want to see how it, it will, it'll unfold. But I will do a little bit of a tease on it, which is just that the Department of Justice has opened an antitrust inquiry into the Overwatch League's uh, uh, what's called a soft salary cap okay, um, or a competitive balance tax. Broad strokes, this is used by a lot of leagues, the MLB and things like that, uh, to make sure that one team doesn't just have all of the money because they're in a big market um, and then get all of the best players and just dominate everybody forever. But then how do you explain the Yankees for about 10 years? Oh, there's a punishment for it, basically. Hey, you spent over the soft salary. You now get to pay a luxury tax that gets redistributed amongst the other teams that don't have same. Huh. Okay. Now, that's an interesting thing, but it's also more 
uh, on the Overwatch League because they now are are in their third and fourth years uh, of this thing, and they don't have a players' union yet. Okay. So because of that, uh, and because of the soft salary cap, um, they just have to. They're just now looking into make sure that everything is as it should be, and that some teams aren't necessarily getting left out in the lurch and told to be quiet because your brand doesn't matter as much as the bigger brands. Um, and, uh, there could be financial repercussions a uh, coming, uh, this far. It is just an inquiry. It is not a, a formal case, uh, and things like that. But, uh, more on that as it develops, because I like the overwatch league, love watching it. Um, and the championships are coming up soon and I'll be chatting about that in the future. Yeah, this could potentially be a developing story. So even if we don't hit it this week, there may be more news about it in the next seven days. Overwatch League is now out of that like, hey, you're doing a thing. Good for you stage that you get in the first couple seasons. And now it's firmly in the growing pains of like, hey, you're an actual thing. Time to start acting like it. Yep. Hey, remember all that paperwork you put out? Now you have to start living up to it. And there's the uh, the company at Activision Blizzard, uh, who are not wholly in charge of it. There is a division of Activision Blizzard, of Blizzard specifically, that is in charge of the Overwatch League. But Activision Blizzard did release a statement that they are fully cooperating and they are very excited to show off the Overwatch League to, <laughs> to the U.S. government. Um, Interesting. It's which, almost like they're banking on a Streisand effect. It could be. <laughs> um, it could also really just be that they know that they're not going to get in trouble for it. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, uh, the U.S. government is very much like, you get an antitrust inquiry, and you get an antitrust inquiry, and you get an antitrust inquiry. <laughs> it's it's basically uh, antitrust Oprah over here. Um, and Activision Blizzard is like, we're fine. Let's go for it. Sure. It's a badge of honor over here. We'll see how that pans out. Um, uh... I, I just gotta point out uh, for the for the folks that do know Overwatch, can't help but notice Papa Jeff leaves. Suddenly, inquiries, characters are less popular than ever. Uh, mm, mm, just saying, there's a correlation. Um. Anyway, folks, I think that is going to do it for the nerd glasses this week. Uh, make sure that you stay tuned. Uh, next week, of course, we'll see if we have more information on those uh, antitrust proceedings as well as more gaming news. In the meantime, stay right here because coming up after the Nerd Glasses podcast, we go offline for up to five minutes and then a 10 minute countdown. And then I am live on The Citadel where I will be playing Prince of Persia. Had a lot of fun with that last week. Uh, the main character is a little too mid 2000s quippy. And annoying, but otherwise beautiful game, and I'm enjoying how it plays when it works. It, it's been fun, so make sure that you uh, stick around for that. Uh, and yeah, make sure that you're following here for stuff all throughout seven days a week. We'll see you right here on the Nerd Glasses podcast next Tuesday at seven. I've been Boater. I've been Dave Mann, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Yeah.